Thank you, Mark. The, um, the J.D. Klein Lectures honor the former chancellor of UBC. The lecture is dedicated to providing the public and the wider community with a deeper perspective on timely issues and a focus on government, business, law, and the arts. And you hear from experts in the field. This is the second of three lectures by Scott McIntyre, who is definitely an expert in his field. A few uh, decades ago, I was on Salt Spring <laughs> Island uh, in a grocery store, and I ran into Beth Appledorn. And Beth, along with Susan, started the Longhouse Bookstore, the first all-Canadian bookstore in Canada, uh, in, in Toronto. Uh, she had since moved out. They had since moved out to Salt Spring. And she said, uh, we're having Scott and Corky McIntyre over for dinner. Would you like to come? And I thought, well, I'm a little outmatched by this company, but uh, I'll give it a shot. And went to dinner and had the time of my life listening to the stories that Beth and Scott shared uh, about Canadian publishing. And they mixed in very personal stories with with their perspective on some of the seminal developments in, in Canadian publishing. Uh, great story about um, when Jack McClellan decided to address uh, one of his many financial crunches by renting the St. Lawrence Market in Toronto and taking all his overstock and putting it on sale to the public, thereby cutting out retailers and the writers who got no royalties for this particular stunt. And I think I remember Beth saying that she grabbed a shopping cart and she just was getting as many books into that shopping cart. She, she thought she was on a rescue mission. <laughs> and the stories went on, and I knew that the history of Canadian publishing was not just an important cultural issue and part of our cultural heritage but that it was filled with characters and stories. Scott's the founding partner of Douglas and McIntyre. He's, uh, over the years, many decades, several decades, let's not say, uh, published something like 2,000 Canadian books. He has honorary degrees in Order of Canada. He serves on boards of cultural industries. And earlier this year, he was the recipient of the Gray Campbell Distinguished Service Award contribute for his contributions to the BC publishing industry. Please welcome Scott Matthews. Thank you all. Now we're just going to have to make sure that my voice carries. <clears throat> so I would delegate to the folk in the back row. If I technologically So we'll try this and I will try to speak up and, and again if, if people please there lots of friends back there if I fade or become incomprehensible, somebody should shout. <laughs> and before I start, because I can't resist uh, stories and the world, <laughs> you raised those, I remember that evening almost like yesterday. But I'll tell one, my wife is hiding because she can't stand this. Um, I'll just tell a couple of last anecdotes about that because I was, I can't use the word, I was volunteered at the very last minute to handle this sale, and it's the only one of the few times in my life I think is, I've worked through the night for a couple of nights, and there was no sleep, all of this stuff. But the event happened, uh, typical McClellan and Stewart, there was a party first. Uh, various authors turned up looking as though they were on the wrong planet. Two, two members, three members, one, this is taking away from time, I suppose, one I'll never forget Jack himself going around with a hammer bashing bashing the spines because the ad had included, you don't know this, the ad had included a world famous scientific encyclopedia, things of Eddie Austin, and people were complaining and I was getting phone calls 
from advertising the advocacy folk in Toronto saying, what are you doing about this? Uh, and it went from there. Uh, Jack and I would sneak out to his car and, and have nips. I mean, it was crazy. But the most, the, the story that, that uh, lingers with me is that Le Leonard Cohen turned out. And again, he looked like he had arrived on the wrong planet. Uh, and he had just released his first record. Uh, and he had a copy with him, and he gave it to my wife. And he said, Corky, love Leonard. And she so disdained his voice, and she left it behind. <laughs> and, but I won't digress, because there, there are a great many of those. Back, Ten years later, 20 years later, we ran into him, because we stayed in the Warwick in, in New York. There he was walking in. Wait, it was the first night of his relaunching. Remember, his, his accountant um, ripped off all his money, and he was back doing that. It was deja vu all over again, but there we go. All right, well, look, um, back to the subject. Welcome, everybody. This is the second of two client lectures. Um, and I do have to be just begin by thanking the board of Green College, a number of whom are here, and obviously the ever-patient Mark Bessie for having put up with all this and having persuaded me to do it, which I think, as it approaches um, midway, I, I think I'm glad I was asked. Okay. There are a couple of administrative issues, but I think we've dealt with them. If the sound doesn't work, shout. Uh, some students last time complained that, that I perhaps want, rambled a bit. They rather wanted a PowerPoint so they could keep track. And I thought briefly about doing that, but I don't do PowerPoint. And finally, of course, I would like to honor all those people, colleagues, former authors uh, in the room who have turned up for this. So bless you all. And I should be intimidated, and I'm going to try very hard not to be. But I have to get that. I have to find a way to turn the pages effectively. What follows uh, is my personal take on what unfolded in Canadian writing and publishing, and its impact upon our literary our literary inheritance. And I suppose I should be terrified, but I'm not. My thesis is that while, of course, publishing is essential and essentially and fundamentally about writers and their words, publishers have played a crucial role. Uh, and we're far more than the mere mechanics we are so often uh, accused of being. It's the writer, it's the publishers who ultimately make the decisions about investments in their writers and who give overall editorial shape to their programs. And that is a, that's the sacred role of the publisher, at least in independent houses, um, belief and conviction, as well as judgment, remain central, as well as patient shareholders, of course. Uh, Roy McSkewing, in his very good 2003 book, The Perilous Trade, called our literature Canada's greatest cultural achievement. Quite a journey. And my purpose tonight is to suggest something of the road we took. <coughs> Let me add my usual caveats. My experience is that of a trade publisher creating books for the general market, so that while I will touch upon the other genres of publishing, including what were once called school books and scholarly books, my purpose here is to sketch the relationship between publishers and writers and the impact that had on the development of English Canadian literature. Quebec is quite a different story, and while it is an important one, and one that I would have loved telling, uh, given my many friends in Quebec publishing, uh, my focus here is on what happened uh, in the rest of Canada. Prior to, to about 1950, writing and publishing in Canada was a moribund affair, characterized by ang anglicized colonial timidity. And a profound lack of belief in anything Canadian or blatantly cultural. Publishers, such as they were, had been established primarily to distribute the books of their U.S. and U.K. masters, which meant that books from the U.S. and the U.K. were, in, were relatively available, although primarily those school books purchased by, Siri, by, by various provincial entities. As this process resulted in occasional large sales, some companies began to Canadianize textbooks, generally following the specific demands of local school boards and ministries of education. This ensured that Ontario ruled. 
The Maritimes were invisible, and the West was viewed as fertile ground to be exploited. Sounds familiar. Earl Corey characterized the literary arts in Canada then as dead set in adolescence. In 1950, there were 40 publisher distributors operating in Canada in total, handling the, bo the books of some 700 US and UK companies. Sales of Canadian books totaled just over $200 million, most of that to school. By 1990, there were 450 publishers enjoying sales of $2.2 billion. In 1949, 14 Canadian novels and a, and a further 39 books of poetry and drama were published in total, and that number was shrinking. 60% of all books in Canadian schools were American. Governor General's award winners received no money, and, and for many years they had to pay their own way to Ottawa to receive the award. Today's generous literary prizes, notably the Giller and, and Ian Williams last night, who's an associate, I remember him here, uh, very happy night for him. <laughs> Publishers were, were shackled by the systemic limit limitations, which mostly still weigh upon us. A small disparate market, the Canadian Booksellers Association, so founded in 1952, counted a total of 35 member booksellers. Weak media interest, uh, Bob Weaver was, was a lone voice uh, in the, when he joined CBC Radio in the 1950s, overwhelming dominance by the books from our neighbor to the south, where the economies of scale allow books to be less expensive, um, and many American publishers were ignoring imperial copyright, which made their prices even more, more, more uh, effective. Um, and an, an ongoing bias towards anything Canadian as being second rate uh, by far too many librarians and academics for a long time. In spite of the odds, some Canadian writers enjoyed success during these years, always because they were published in other places. Three that come to mind are Robert Service, Ernest Thompson Seton, who happens to be my great, aunt, my great uncle, uh, and Bliss Carmen. A lonely active publisher was the Ryerson Press, a unit of the United Church of Canada, which had released 40 new books in 1897. You can imagine the editorial strictures on manuscripts with any juice to them. One critic noted, without a hint of irony, publishing in Canada was a pre profession for gentlemen, preferably gentlemen with English or Scots accents. In 1951, the, the, ground, the groundbreaking Royal, Royal Commission on National Development of the Arts, Letters and Sciences, now known as the Massey Commission, began with the question, is it true then that we are a people without a literature? And alas, the answer to that question then was a resounding yes. With those publishing executives who had gone on business of break, I, I was originally going to say I will trigger for those who are losing track where there's a kind of a break in subject matter. With those publishing executives who had gone off to war returning and rejoining their companies, and a growing, a growing optimism beginning to declare itself, by the late 1940s and early 1950s, new energy was being unleashed. The economy was booming, and rapidly rising school en en enrollments were uh, sorry, we're, we're kick-starting the sales of school books, thereby strengthening the economic basis of those established companies. Some of the growing largesse was begrudgingly channeled into trade publishing. A few houses led the way, and in each case run by a bookman committed to Canadian writers and their stories. Let me single out three. John, John, John Gray of Macmillan, Mark Janare of the University of Toronto Press, and Jack McClelland at McClelland and Stewart. Although there were others, including Warren Pierce at, at uh, Ryerson and Bill Toe at Oxford. These men were passionate about books and about Canada and were given the necessary support to take risks. Either between they or their families owned the companies or they had sympathetic boards. Macmillan was blessed by being, by having strong managers running the companies two most profitable areas, 
agency distribution, and educational publishing. So John Gray was able to devote, to devote his energy to rebuilding the trade program. That and his personal pension for Canadian history led to a program that, be, that became one of the two strongest for any Canadian house. <coughs> Being close to the University of Toronto campus, uh, Gray was able to sign books from such scholars as Donald Creighton, J.M.S. Carroll, uh, George Stanley, William Kilborn, and Ramsey Cook. It also led him to track down a, a young and icon iconoclastic young Montreal lawyer, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, from whom he extracted uh, federalism and the, the French Canadians. In 1963, he even published his own Lord Selkirk of Red River, which won the UBC Medal for Best Canadian Biography that year. For someone who has suggested that a decision to publish a Canadian book equaled a decision to lose money, he didn't do badly. At also publishing many of Canada's important fiction writers at the time, Maureen Callahan, Hugh McLennan, F. L. Wilson, W. L. Mitchell, and Robertson Davies. As was often the case in that era, long lunches were acceptable. One, following one of them in Montreal, an event to celebrate the, the signing of a new novel from Morley Callahan, and the pages stick, that extended well into the next morning. The party was chauffeured back to City Hall in a limousine by the then mayor of Montreal, Camille Oud. Having lost his keys to City Hall, Oud ordered his, his driver to smash the window to allow them to break in so that the contract could be signed in the mayor's chambers. <laughs> Breaking new ground was not for timid publishers. Uh, and there is a reason John Gray's early memoir was called Fun Tomorrow. Of course, of course, Gray was an accomplished, serious man, who having been something of a hellraiser as a student at Upper Canada College, grew into the, world, the, role, the role of one of the country's leading publishers. And he fully understood the value of loyalty to authors. When Ethel Wilson was very sick uh, and in the hospital toward the end of her life, he wrote or visited several times a week. I met John in, in the 1960s, that's how old I am, and even though I had turned down his offer of a job, he was gracious and extraordinarily civilized. While I eventually chose the, the chaotic charm of Jack McClelland, the, the, the depth and caliber of the Macmillan list was impressive. And it had been primarily shaped by the passions of one key people, her, her figure, Mozart, a real publisher. He was once asked why he had chosen book publishing as a career, and his answer, that is the only business I would consider being in. Until the 1950s, I'm going to have to, maybe, forgive me, I'm going to go there, it's for some. I just need water. Until the 1950s, scholarly publishing inhabited the, the shadows in Canada. Important academic research required being published in the U.S. or the U.K., which virtually eliminated Canadian voices. Reputation lay outside the country. Harold Innes' groundbreaking The Fur Trade in Canada was published by Yale. John Creighton's first book had been financed by the Carnegie Foundation, and even Northrop Fry had been first published by Oxford and Princeton. The, the, the Massey Commission had lamented that Canadian publishers cannot, as a, as a rule, bear the inevitable loss of having to cope with the very small Canadian scholarly market. And that only began to change with the foundation of the Canada Council in 1957. While the University of Toronto Press had been established in 1901, the, its core mandate had remained the publishing of a few academic journals. Marshawn Ray, along with his Along with his strong-willed accomplice, Kent Francis Halpenny, usurped the agenda. We're moving to the UTP from the primarily educational publisher, Top Clark, in 1953, John Ray felt he had been given a clear publishing mandate, and he most certainly took it. He had been anointed by Lieutenant <coughs> Colonel Eric Phillips, the chairman of the university's board the most powerful, experienced, outspoken, and ruthless businessman anywhere on the horizon. 
newly arrival, newly arrived John Ray made the point that scholarly publishing could never make money. And if the university did not want to dump significant resources into the press on an ongoing basis, <coughs> the press needed to develop a parallel semi-commercial program. To paraphrase, if you want to break even and make some, make some waves, you have to have the guts to do trade publishing. His wish, his, wish, his wish was granted. The result, in my view, was that from the late 1950s into the 1970s, the UTP became one of the very best university presses in North America. And the program which resulted was exceptional. Dawson's William, William Lyon and Kansas King, yeah, Pigger Skills added, edited diaries, the, the Mackenzie King record, Lester Pearson's three volumes of memoirs, Marshall McLuhan's The, Ju the Gutenberg Galaxy, which in 1962 sold 60,000 copies, John Porter's Pur The Vertical Music, Mosaic, <laughs> Russell Harper's Painting in Canada, and Yosef Carter's Portraits of Greatness amongst them. When the first printing of the, of the Karsh arrived in Canada, to everyone's dismay, individual pages were inadvertently pulling out of the binding. Rather than submit to panic, Jean Array ordered an elegant insert placed into every book, suggested that a special thermoplastic binding had been used, and it representing, re represented a unique dis achievement in the history of printing. <laughs> that allowed, uh, in print, which allowed individual prints to be taken out of the book and framed. <laughs> the subterfuge worked, and the large first printing sold out. Even reviewers failed to, to point out the flaw. <laughs> Never underestimate the guile of a terrified publisher. <laughs> Ambitious scholarly pro projects uh, remain cornerstone and included such ambitious ones as the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, the Economic Atlas of Ontario, and some 60 volumes, now 86 and counting, uh, of English translations of the great of the great work of Erasmus. And Mark, I think you know something about this as you're involved. John Ray demonstrated the skills of a, dedic of a dedicated publisher at work. He was accomplished at pulling all of the necessary strings, from hiring Alan Fleming and his colleagues, uh, Peter Dorn and, and Will Reuter, without question the best book design team in Canada and North America at that time, to raising huge subsidies from Canadian and American sources, all to further distinguish scholarly publishing. And his board let him get away with it. Uh, he was even responsible for the press making small profits in those years. And that's the mark of a real publisher. <laughs> he, found, he also found time to advise the federal government on copyright law. It helped establish the Canadian presence at the Frankfurt Book Fair and held the pen on the 1973 final report of the Ontario Royal Commission on Book Publishing. He could rightly be given credit as the, as the founder of effective scholarly publishing in this country. I've left words about the third of this trio, Jack McClellan, to the end, as I am overly biased. My former formative years in Canadian publishing were spent with McClellan and Stewart in Toronto, and that terrific cauldron of energy shaped my views. M&S embodied new school publishing, a driven, passionate environment where Jack's mantra, we publish authors, not books, uh, ruled roost. And what a roost it was. Uh, a virtual who's who of what has become the Canadian literary class canon. Margaret Atwood, Pierre Burton, Margaret Lawrence, Leonard Cohen, Irving Layton, Farley Mullet, Peter Newman, and, uh, and Gabrielle Watt, to name but a few. M&S was not the only company publishing Canadian authors, those I've already mentioned, plus Clark Irwin and some others who lay claim to that, but its stable was the, was the broadest and most impressive. Jack had returned from the war a, a hero and joined what was then still a family company co-founded by his father and a, business, and, and, a, and a business partner in 1906. At age 30, in 1952, Jack took command at a time when the company was still driven by the old distribution model. In 1961, the company was still only publishing 
38 new titles annually. But the next year, not to do that. The next year, MS adopted as its tagline the Canadian publisher. So the intent was clear. In 1965, the company dumped 23 of its 28 agency lines to focus on Canadian publishing, a huge and counterintuitive risk at the time. Two years later, when I arrived there as a, a wide-eyed kid from the West, there were 81 new Canadian books on the program, and, and chaos reigned supreme. While charismatic, driven, and absolutely committed to Canadian writers, Jack had an ironic side. I am ideally equipped for publishing because I know a little, but very little, almost nothing in fact, about almost everything. Irony or not, there was no mistaking Jack's passion for his writers. What was less appreciated was how editorially hands-on he was. He wrote brilliant letters. And remember, this is before the, this is before the internet. Often working until mid midnight in an office above his garage in Forest Hill, when, when we compared notes once, he casually mentioned that he averaged some 30 letters a night, significantly more than I did, although he may have just been scoring competitive points. And they were not short notes. His editorial cheerleader, cheerleading was enthusiastic, but all was tempered by a shrewd, uh, instinctive, and sometimes very blunt editorial perspective. The outpouring of, edit of energy and promotional charisma, which characterized M&S, uh, att attracted and entertained and maintained a, a growing stable of, of talented writers, and they shared a loyalty to Jack personally, in spite of the administrator, administrative chaos and financial pressures, which so often characterized the company. Those of us there at the, at the time understood that we were somehow part of an extraordinary moment in Canadian history, the forging of a national literary culture. The, the authors MS built our legion, but what is less understood now is the breadth of the additional publishing risks MS was taking. To single out just a few, the New Canadian Library, a reprint series of literary classics, an illustrated book division, which launched the Canadian Centennial Library in partnership with Weekend Magazine, headed by Pierre Burton, and headquartered downtown on Simcoe, Simcoe Street because Burton refused to drive out to Hollinger House, which was in the suburb. Uh, the Canadian Centenary Series, a uh, history of Canada in 17 volumes from the country's most distinguished historians. The Canadian Bestseller Library, uh, an early attempt to enter the mass paperback market and the Carleton Library, a scholarly series undertaken in partnership with Carleton University. Later, a startup affiliate which, for which significant new financing had been arranged, Natural Science of Canada, produced the 15-volume Canadian Heritage series and a library of eight rich, richly illustrated natural history guides to the, geo the geographic regions of Canada. Given the sponsorship of this talk, it seems appropriate to mention that J.V. Klein was an investor in that program when he was still at McMillan Lavelle. The downside of this explosive, explosive energy was that Jack's ideas and drive outpaced an always fickle Canadian market and the company's financial resources. Cash, cash flow crises were frequent. And eventually, after many ups and downs and last minute reprieves, the company was sold to Abby Bennett. A wealthy, a wealthy real estate developer in 1985. Abby once boasted to Peter Newman that he had made a fortune in Canadian publishing. MS was losing so much money, between a million and two million dollars a year, that he had sold his shopping centers at what turned out to be the very top of the real estate market. <laughs> Jack McClellan transformed what was possible in Canadian publishing, always pushing boundaries while always on the edge. Many U.S. publishers of the, of the time had, had equivalent instincts and energy, Alfred Tanoff comes to mind, but the American market was large enough and wealthy enough to sustain such personal publishing. Leonard Cohen best summed up the author's view of Jack. You were the real Prime Minister of Canada. You still are. And even though it's all gone down the tubes, the country you, that you govern will never fall apart. How are we doing for time? Oh, okay. Uh, let me just grab some more of this.
Expo 67 had unleashed an outpouring of cultural energy in Canada, and publishing was caught up in that. Independent bookstores were beginning were operating across the country, notably Herdig in Edmonton in 1956 and Duffy Books in Vancouver in 1957. Libraries and universities were beginning to accept that the, people, that the public wanted Canadian books, and media coverage of writers and books was frequent and intense. Given Hal Wake is in the room, I must single out the Peter Zosky show, where Hal was once a producer. An author interview on that show ignited many national bestsellers. What we used to refer to as an MS special, a national tour by authors such as Pierre Burton and Farley Mowat, where every day was a different town and included eight to ten media interviews, uh, appearances, and, and sometimes several autographing parties, hugely expanded the cachet enjoyed by Canadian books. Sales responded accordingly. Canadian books were sexy. By the 1970s, there were even there were even stores selling exclusively Canadian books. Longhouse in Toronto, uh, Double Hook in Montreal, I'll go later, and Books Canada in Ottawa. There was now a new generation coming of age. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, a collection of small, idealistic startups, fueled more by energy and political passion than by expertise or financial resources, began popping up in all parts of the country. Amongst them were Coach House Press, House of the Nancy, New Press, Arsenal Pulp, Harbor, Lesser and Orphan, uh, Goose Lane, Talon Books, Tundra, Herdig, uh, Key Porter, and even Douglas and McIntyre. They were, many were run by writers and intellectuals, uh, where working capital was almost a dirty phrase. But the market was still tiny. The total ca Canadian domestic market was a pathetic 222 million, of which 5 million was export. But there was much adventuresome publishing done, for which, for which I'll repeat, or, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll return. But one important outcome of this fresh energy was the politicization of the business, which tended to borrow rhetoric from the new left in the US. There were branch plants, foreign owned publishers, and Canadian publishers, who, had a, who, who of course, as a given, were doing noble, if mostly invisible, work. During my time from 1970 to 1977 as a sales rep for many of these companies, I was caught up in the cause. To the extent that Bill Duffy once growled at me, only half in jest, you and all your Maoist friends. Uh, this new agenda, with its more aggressive tactics, began to impact public policy. To leverage their strength, a number of these small houses joined together in 1971 to form the Independent Publishers Association which later morphed into what is now the Association of Canadian Publishers. The primary purpose of all this was to lobby government for support, uh, support measures which were to level the playing field so that Canadian companies dedicated to publishing Canadian authors could compete with the, re the resources of the much larger old line houses, which clung together in the old school Canadian Book Publishers Council, dominated by multinationals and ed educational publishers. Over time, this political activism made headway, exacerbated by the sale of two iconic Canadian companies uh, to foreign owners. In 1970, uh, Gage was sold to the U.S. House, Scott Fortman, it was a leading education publisher. And the same year, Ryerson, the old publishing branch of the United Church, was sold to McGraw-Hill. When Jack McClellan then announced that m &S was for sale, government panicked. The Ontario Royal Commission on Book Publishing had reported in 1973, and one consequence was the impetus for a $1 million emergency loan to save McClellan and Stewart. Ontario also established a loan guarantee program for Canadian controlled publishers. Within a few years, the Canada Council had expanded its writing and publishing support programs, and the Ontario Arts Council had established a system of block grants. In 1973, the Writers' Union of Canada was launched, and the pervasive voices of the country's writers joined the fray. In 1974, the federal government moved to regulate foreign investment in the book industry through the Foreign Investment Review Agency. This highly controversial 
uh, intent to forcibly Canadian, Canadianize the business led a few years later to what is still referred to as the Bay Como policy in order of the town where it was announced <coughs> by Mulroney's <coughs> Nationalist Cultural Affairs Minister, Marcel Mass. Alas, this proved a mug scam, as the federal bureaucracy never had the heart for, this, for such draconian policy initiatives, and Mass's Anglo colleagues hated the idea. So did the Americans who brought their baseball bats, actually. But the, the spread of a new Canadian economic nationalism did push the old English house, Macmillan, to sell its Canadian unit to McLean Hunter, which, of course, proceeded to destroy it. Uh, m and entered into a Bantam Seal alliance, which theoretically gave m and its long sought, sought after mass paperback uh, unit. And in the most astounding move of all, Anna Porter bought Doubleday Canada, admittedly with money from its German parent. <coughs> there was a sense in certain cultural quarters in Ottawa that policy, and of course more money, could repatriate the cultural industries. All of these dares ultimately came to naught. As soon as the Canadian government caved, only a few years later, uh, that, that brief flame was extinguished, and nothing has changed since. Government money also flowed into export development, which led to an, to an attempt to launch an international Frankfurt-style fair in Montreal. Idealistic in the extreme, that was doomed to failure from the start. There was no here, here, no scale, and few Canadian houses of of size and club within the international market. But, once again, individual publishers led the action while producing admittedly mixed results. At one point, at one time, the ACP was considered the most effective cultural lobby in Ottawa, which speaks loudly about the, edit, the energy with which the new publishers were addressing the issue. And government was listening. Writers and their, and their books were considered that important to the national interest. Uh, that's a long time ago. But what about the actual publishing? One of the important characteristics of the smaller houses was that risk was in their DNA. And as literary agents were still playing a relatively minor role in Canada, <clears throat> the advances were ne neg negligible. Uh, the writers in this room could speak to that. Coach House was an author-driven author co-op. And most of the other small houses existed on a wing and a prayer. But their authors were voices we now treasure. Michael Ndaji, Margaret Atwood, B.P. Nichol, uh, Graham, Graham Gibson, Heather Robertson, Dennis Lee, Rock Carrier, Dave Godfrey, and Matt Cohen, amongst others. And their books changed the game, becoming symbols of a new country with new possibilities. There was also irreverence. Coach House, which set tight for other publishers to help fund its publishing program, had a device printed in the blank stomach of a beaver inserted in the margins of its books. The message read, Made in Canada by Mindless Acid Freaks. <laughs> it was not, an, it was not <laughs> so amusing when I showed first proofs of Sandra Colbert's Bittersweet Lemons and Love to, to her husband, Leo Colbert, at that time, a major fundraiser for the Liberal Party, and, a and only recently, until recently, a Canadian senator. And, and, and this was in his expanded, expansive office on the top floor of Pat Place de Marie in Montreal. He didn't get the joke, and I didn't stick around to explain it. <laughs> Mel Hurdig took the extraordinary step of persuading the province of Alberta to commit substantial seat funding to what was to become the Canadian Encyclopedia, now in digital form through the Canadian Heritage Foundation. This was superb, daring publishing. And Mel's re reward was that the first edition, three, three volumes set, published in 1984, sold out of an astounding 150,000 sets. Choosing to invest the profits into a, a, additional idealistic uh, projects, Mel eventually went a bridge too far with a children's version of the encyclopedia and endured his business being destroyed by the predator tactics of Coles and Chapters. That's another source. Live by scale, die by scale. That is all too often the lesson of adventures in publishing. Lester Norton opened its doors in 1973 to be joined by Louise Dennis a few years later. 
with Malcolm Lester Hanley nonfiction and Louise leveraging her stellar literary connections, she is Graham Greene's, Graham Greene's niece, uh, the program began to punch far above its weight. In 1980, they launched an international fiction list, uh, which was indeed a bold venture. As Louise once said, with great frustration, trying to split territorial rights for Canada away from US and UK houses, we were a bone caught between two dogs. And it was, there were some ugly moments there, I can tell you. But the list, that list grew to include Yusuf Sarecki, um, Italia Calvino, Casio Ishigura, uh, Graham Greene, and William Trevor, as well as Canadians Joey Kagawa, Marie Claire Blay, Anthony Maillet, and Alberto Nangel. It was a superb dare and the creation of two people of conviction and connection. Alas, as was to uh, become so often the case in Canada, publishing skills alone weren't sufficient, and the company eventually floundered for a lack of working capital. Malcolm carried on as a publisher in his own eponymous firm for some years. Louise, who had very much wanted to find a new home, new Canadian home, ultimately became the publisher of Canoff Canada, a perfect match between a skillful editorial eye and a prestigious program backed by adequate resources. I have to comment, but I'm going to have to have some more first. I have to comment on Anna Porter, one of my closest friends in publishing, and no stranger here. In fact, she was hoping to be here tonight, but is just back from Hungary, where she launched the, the Hungarian edition of her George Soros book. Key Porter started about the same time as DNM and launched with a big bang. Anna had talked Hal Pitya into doing a book after he, after he had lost the liberal leadership to John Turner. And what a book it can't, turned out to be. Straight from the heart, went on to sell 120,000 copies in hardcover, catapulting Key Porter uh, to national attention as the new hot house. Once again, the mark of an, an aggressive publisher, tempting fate. Key Porter and the DNM followed parallel often highly competitive paths. Uh, and at one time, we seriously looked at putting our two companies together. Uh, there was an investment on the table, and in retrospect, I wish we had. We shared a view that Canada needed one or two independents of scale. I only singled out a fraction of the books published by the small and what became medium-sized presses. Uh, in the interest of different behavior, I have also left DNM out of the story. And, what, and, and it's what became the largest art book and environmental studies programs in Canadian publishing. Uh, those curious can ask, can ask questions at the end of the talk. The important thing is that these publishing houses carved out significant space for Canadian writers in every region of the country. Unfortunately, all too often, the smaller houses became uh, farm, farm teams for the multinationals, who with their deeper pockets we're beginning to respond to the, ro the growing international reputations of Canadian writers, particularly fiction writers, and to the demands of the, their ever more powerful literary agents. Perhaps Canada's greatest publishing success, and the one most directly resulting from the leadership of strong-minded individuals, is in the world of children's books. Beginning in a literal vacuum, Several Canadian houses have grown to international stature, with publishers elsewhere, particularly European publishers, admiring their creative independence and defiance of market imperatives. As Sheila Egoff noted wistfully in her seminal book, The Republic of Childhood, in 1968, US publishers released 3,874 new titles, UK publishers, 2,075, and Canadian publishers, 47. There was nowhere to go but up. Five companies stand out, ground with Kidscan, Anik, Orca, and Thunder. Because children's publishing requires fewer financial resources than does adult publishing, the international world of children's editors and publishers is more closely knit and more congenial, and literary agents play a smaller role. Uh, taste and creative risk-taking can dominate. In each case, these houses have been guided by publishers of fierce passion. I should know, as we finance the growth of Groundwood, 
and with Patsy Aldana as a business partner, <laughs> sharp opinions could be counted on, if any of you knew Patsy. Um, but because Patsy was a brilliant publisher, and her international network uh, was second to none, I had the good sense to keep my editorial distance. Brownwood won more Governor General's awards than any other Canadian publisher and broke such new ground as launching a Spanish language program for the U.S. and that Latin America. Groundwood was honored as North American Publisher of the Year during the 2016 Bologna Children's Book Fair, with KidsCan taking the honor the following year. KidsCan was still, in fact, a tiny company when Valerie Hussey joined it in 1979, soon joined by Ricky Anglander. Anglund and they, model, they modeled their, their cross-discipline program on those of American publishers and produced a growing range of award-winning nonfiction books. They also discovered a little turtle named Franklin, now starring in some 30 books with 40 million copies in print internationally. In 1998, they sold their company to Nelvana for some $7 million, as Nelvana was seeking new characters and stories for an animated television series. There are occasionally happy endings in Canadian publishing. Tundra established the reputation of the illustrated uh, Anne Blades, uh, with Mary of Miley Teen. Anik enjoys the, the huge successes of Robert Munch. And, and, uh, and Orca has carved out a respected international niche from its Victoria base. Children's publisher, I can't talk for an hour without stumbling. <laughs> Children's publishers discovered early on that the international market is essential, and it is only engaging the world that allows the publishing to succeed. Now, most Canadian children's publishers sell over 75% of their books into the international market. That is tough to do with adult nonfiction, where Canadian stories are of little interest. But what the kids' publishers have, have carved out is impressive and sustainable. That model is increasingly being followed by other small and medium-sized Canadian homes. One of the curses of success is that people notice. As Canadian writers began to make, making waves in the world, large multinationals began to take Canada more seriously. Because of historically weak ownership law in Canada, most of the major houses had established early footprints here. When draconian ownership law de designed to strengthen the Canadian sector, sector was put in place, ironically by a conservative, not a liberal government, as Marcel Mass liked to remind me, they flourished. Those with established Canadian operations had been grandfathered in, uh, thereby avoiding the requirements of new and and tougher ownership requirements. As international consolidation uh, accelerated, the huge profitable backlists provided by parent companies, plus access to virtually unlimited working capital for high-profile publishing, allowed the playing field to gradually tilt south. This was manna from heaven for the literary agents, of course, and wonderful for some writers. The shift, this shift lured many of our best writers to the major multinationals. Penguin Random House, Harper Collins, and more recently Simon & Schuster. The same dominance of scale, which had so <coughs> got at educational publishing in, uh, in, in the country, has forced Canadian trade publishing to be either very large or very small. There are almost no Canadian houses left in the middle ground if the threshold is a sales volume of over $10 million. Even the largest remaining independents, Anansi, Thunder, ECW, uh, Harbour, Douglas and McIntyre, and now Greystone, are tiny by international standards. 80% of Canada's 245 book publishing houses have fewer than 10 employees, and only 7% have more than 25. To put this in some perspective, Penguin Random House has sales of over 300 million in this country alone. The rise of the multinationals in Canada has, been, has, has not necessarily been a bad thing. I mean, these lar large houses are run by and staffed by talented professional Canadians. Yes, financial and administrative management is overseen from head office, but the editorial decisions 
and that essential creative collaboration between writers and their editors remains here, although in every case in Toronto. Critically, marketing is much stronger, as clout requires clout, so that Indigo chapters and Amazon can be better managed. They also bring an impressive degree of international connectivity, ultimately better for our writers. So multinationals have also made substantial contributions to the infrastructure of the business, from writers' festivals to writing and publishing courses in universities to such entities as the Writers' Trust of Canada. Scale is the way of the world now. But our smaller houses play underneath the juggernauts, but, but they remain defiantly inventive in their publishing. The range and depth of the country's smaller houses and university presses in every region of Canada ensures a multitude of voices can be heard. As, as, the, as, the, as the large houses come under ever more pressure to enhance their bottom line and whittle down their programs, more space is being created underneath. And 80% of new Canadian author books are still published by Canadian owned houses. The ecology of the Canadian sector remains nourished by, by public funding, a very Canadian circumstance, although one that causes many of our international colleagues, particularly the Americans, to lurch between envy and eye roll. Between the Canada Council, what is now called the Canada Book Fund, uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and provincial tax credits, much good publishing continues and the smaller companies can re remain true to their editorial mandates. Public policy, though, can offer a Hobson's choice. While our government programs remain impressively arm's length, the application processes are debilitating, this is my opinion, and, and the time lags to get approvals verge on ridiculous, and they are always under threat of unexpected program cuts. In total, they allow survival, but not much beyond life support. There's just enough money to get into trouble, uh, often not enough to get out of it. Uh, even with this level of support, Canada remains a very small market, and the divide between the two official languages remains a structural impart impediment. Sadly, in book publishing, two solitudes still prevail, to all the far too great an extent. The dominance of indigo uh, worsens the circumstance, although export is, is beginning to change the game. Our major writers increasingly use agents in New York and London, and who can blame them? As a publishing nation, we are very small potatoes. In 1996, UNESCO ranked Canada 21st on its list of books published per year, by far the lowest of the G7, and well below such, such, such countries as Australia and Argentina. My suspicion is that our rank of, uh, ranking has slipped significantly since then. <coughs> Let me conclude on a much more optimistic note by reflecting on the, the accomplishments of our writers, which, after all, is what all of this should be about. From Alison Rose recent Nobel, Nobel Prize, Margaret Atwood's Testaments, the literary event of the season this year, Wade Davis's 2012 Samuel Johnson Prize for the best nonfiction book in the English language that year, and several recent Booker winners. Our writers, our writers have achieved real stature and are sought out everywhere. Writers from Canada have become something of an international brand, with a continuing parade of talented new voices, uh, just a step, just a Sampling of, of, of which will be Madeline Tien, which is here, David Desmokis, uh, Essie Edru, Edru, Edrigan, uh, Richard Wagonese, Naomi Klein, Ronnie Hodge, and Marion Tates, uh, and, and I could go on forever. Uh, and now a Canadian prize, the Giller, trans, transforms sales of each year's winner, which indeed Ian Williams is about to discover. One of the more satisfying trends amongst our new writers now is that their, their interests are wide and much more international than in the past. Without producing a long list, I immediately think of the two writers, Deborah Campbell, James McKinnon, and John Valiant. Next year, Canada will be the theme nation at the Frankfurt Book Fair. It took 20 years of lobbying to persuade the Canadian government to pony up the necessary entry, entry fee, which is now $6.5 million. 
but it will elevate our entire writing and publishing uh, environment. And one should never look a gift horse, gift horse in the mouth, uh, even an expensive one. Hal Wake, of course, who's involved in getting some of our authors there, may have more to say about that later. Canadian publishing has matured and seems stable now, with energetic houses in every region of the country. Our writers are enjoying ever-increasing international success. And for the most part, that success is still instigated by publishers. Our culture is blessed by those who choose to follow the calling, I'm going to call it a calling mark, uh, of book publishing in all its iterations. Together with our writers, these missionaries have created a national literary culture, a great gift to us all and to future generations. Thank you.